And for the scientific update, I'd like to invite up Dr. Jonathan Glass from Emory and also from one of the new members, Niels. Thank you very much um, for asking me to come and uh, talk about the research update. I do want to make a comment about Tammy's um, presentation. As a clinician, it's extraordinarily important what you're doing because um, I took out my first slide, which unfortunately spoke to this, but the incidence of ALS really hasn't changed. But the number of people at risk for ALS increases because our population gets older, and so the more older people we have, the more people at risk, and the population gets bigger. But the other real important thing, and hopefully this will happen, is that the prevalence of this disease will go up. Because if people live longer with this disease, we will have more and more people to take care of. And so my relatively small group of people who can take care of the 500 folks we take care of, that may blossom to 1,000. And so the resources that we are going to need in the future, hopefully, are going to be much, much more because there will be more and more people living with this disease as opposed to dying with this disease. So I think it's a fantastic piece of work you guys are doing. How do I advance the slides? Oh, the big green arrow. Thank you. Okay. Um, so um, I was asked to give a little bit of a research update, and, and the good news is there's too much. Um, the amount of research that's been going on over the last uh, several years, and especially over 2017, is really remarkable. The amount of discoveries that are being made, the amount of uh, new scientists that are being brought into the field um, is, is really extraordinary. Um, throughout my career, I have never seen so much activity, so many publications, so many meetings, so many arguments, so many discussions, um, which is, is really encouraging for the future. So I'm going to just focus on a few things that I thought might be of interest to you. Um, I'm going to talk about ALS and frontotemporal dementia, which is a topic that I've become very interested in over the last several years. It's remarkable how these two diseases that are clinically so different can overlap so much in terms of their um, uh, genetics, their clinical picture, and, and the pathological features of them. I'm going to talk specifically about the c 9 orf 72 hexanucleotide repeat expansion, which many of you have heard about. It is the most common uh, um, disease mutation that, that causes ALS in families, but also causes FTD in families. And then um, probably the most exciting thing that's happened over the last year is the approval, at least in the United States, of a new drug for ALS. And I'm going to show you the data on that. So ALS and frontotemporal dementia. Um, many of you have seen this, um, and it's, it's a frightening disease. Um, and patients uh, with ALS typically get what we call the behavioral variant of frontal temporal dementia. And there are many different types of frontal temporal dementia. And, and um, the one that we see in ALS is uh, a disorder that causes disinhibition, apathy. Uh, patients um, uh, develop inertia. They will lie in bed with their eyes open, don't get out of bed. Um, they'll actually um, uh, pee in their pants um, because they just don't feel like going to the bathroom not because they can't control their urine. And so um, it, it's a remarkable and very distressing disorder. But there are other types of, uh, of frontotemporal dementia, primary progressive aphasia, where people um, have an inability to speak, um, and then semantic dementia, where they actually can speak, but they make mistakes. We typically don't see that in patients uh, with ALS. It does happen, but we don't typically see it. Um, and then there's this subgroup of patients uh, that we call ALS with cognitive impairment. Now, um, these are patients who seem to continue to function, and if you see them in the clinic, they, you're not really sure whether they're demented, where the other folks are spectacularly demented, and, and you can tell right away. But if you do actual formal testing on them, um, the testing is abnormal. Now, we don't know what the denominator is there. We don't know what patients in, or just normal people off the street, if we did testing on them, what they would really score. Um, but these are folks who are cognitively impaired, and the real question right now is, does that cognitive impairment, um, like in Alzheimer's disease, where you have a, uh, a cognitive impairment that goes to Alzheimer's disease, it's not clear yet whether these folks with cognitive impairment, if they live long enough, will f develop full-blown dementia. Um, this is a video. If you could run this. This is a patient I saw just a few weeks ago. Hey, Tim. How you doing? This is a very high-functioning lawyer. Why are you here? What you're going to see is some repetitive behaviors. What you see Tim, is can you tell us what's going on? to him. 
and uh, things that he'll do is just spontaneously get up. He would walk in and out of the room if we didn't have the door closed. Come on back, Tim. He's going to punch that button. He'll turn on and off the light switch. Okay, we're going to go sit down again, okay? Again, a high-functioning lawyer in the community who over the last six to eight months has developed this. He's also got ALS, and actually, for those of you in the audience uh, who are clinicians or have experienced, uh, he's also got a little bit of Parkinsonism, which again is not uh, that unusual in our population. So this isn't new. Um, we may have rediscovered it, but it's just not new. Um, in fact, if you look at the literature, even um, from Europeans uh, back in the turn of the century, 1900, a little bit after that, um, there has been discussion of abnormalities, psychiatric abnormalities, and dementia in patients with motor neuron disease. Here's one from 1930 from the Mayo Clinic. And what you can see here um, is, is there a pointer here as well? Yep. Um, what you can see here uh, back in 1926, inability to speak suspecting that her husband was with another woman. She'd readily forget things in her immediate environment, even when she might, uh, what she might be doing at the time. So um, this paranoia is also something that you see in patients uh, with frontotemporal dementia. Um, her tongue was weak and atrophied. She clearly has ALS. She has fibrillary twitching, seen around the mouth, biceps and triceps muscles. Um, and in fact, what you can see here, she would dress at every opportunity, putting her clothing on over her night clothes. So, bizarre behavior, paranoid behavior, um, clearly demented, but also uh, having ALS. Um, here's another patient uh, from this publication. Uh, this is a farmer, um, 1928, um, and he was brought in. He had atrophy of his muscles and his arms and his hand. His speech was abnormal, so he had some bulbar disease, but then he became irritable and quarrelsome, and sometimes these patients with FTD uh, will become uh, violent, and we've had uh, family members call us in the middle of the night saying, what do I do? Uh, he's lashing out at everybody. Um, and so this is another problem that we need to, to deal with. Um, and then here's one, stand behind a farm implement, staring at it, doing nothing for several hours at a time. Clearly dementia associated with ALS, and clearly the behavioral type of changes that we see in patients with frontotemporal dementia. Um, but in fact, the familial nature of this is also not new. And here's a publication from the early 1970s, um, where in fact, here are three first cousins, one, two, three. And uh, each of these folks uh, have ALS. But if you look at the description, and I'll just say from the medical literature, they used to do a great job describing cases. We don't do that anymore. Um, the journals say, oh, no, make it smaller, make it smaller. But if you go back to the old data and the old journals, that goes on for pages, and it's really instructive. Um, and so here, here's case one, case two, and case three. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but again, um, this person uh, uh, has ALS and has irritability and hypersexuality, problems with speech and swallowing, uh, fasciculations of the tongue, face, and limb muscles, um, and in fact, um, not clear whether this patient actually had dementia, but you can see that these are first cousins, and down here, the first cousin of case one and two, inappropriate behavior and frontotemporal cortical atrophy on, on, um, on autopsy. So again, here's the, here's the familial nature of ALS and FTD. So I've also I've already said to you, it's kind of remarkable that these two diseases that are so different that they'll show up in different clinics actually can be, happen in the same person. But they can actually happen in the same family. And what I'm going to show you now um, is that they can happen um, actually for the same genetic abnormality. This is what it looks like pathologically. And this is a patient, this is a, a normal brain at autopsy. Um, you can see, um, you'll just have to compare it, what it looks like for a patient with ALS and FTD. Um, and uh, what you see here is the extraordinary atrophy in the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe, the large um, uh, ventricles here. Um, and it's very focal atrophy in the frontal and temporal areas. And that's where it gets its name. Um, so the pathologists um, were aware of this kind of overlap um, even before we started paying more attention to it. And in fact, there were dementias that were called motor neuron type of dementias. And that's because of these inclusions uh, that are called ubiquitin inclusions, these abnormal inclusions in neurons that were found uh, in the brains of patients with dementia, but were also found in the spinal cords in the brains of patients with ALS. And so the pathologists called this, 
um, as you can see here, motor neuron disease, inclusion, dementia. Um, and then these things came out around 2005, and that's an important date. Um, is motor neuron disease, inclusion, dementia a form for us of ALS? And so here's the connection pathologically between ALS and frontotemporal dementia. And in fact, in 19, I'm sorry, in 2006, this remarkable uh, discovery was made, um, an, an amazing amount of work, probably one of the most important um, uh, scientific discoveries, I believe, in ALS and FTD, uh, done by the group at the University of Pennsylvania of John Trojanowski and Virginia Lee. Um, and uh, what you see here is they identified these inclusions. And these inclusions they found in both ALS and FTD, and the protein they found is called TDP43. TDP43 now is really the pathological defining abnormality in patients with both ALS and at least a subset, about 50% of patients uh, with FTD. But in fact, all patients with ALS and FTD have these TDP43 inclusions. Um, <clears throat> and so um, this is just the genetics of, of ALS. And this is clearly not up to date. Leonard's in the audience. You could probably up to date, make this a little bit more up to date. Um, and um, you can see here back in 1993, the first discovery in families with ALS of SOD1, which is really um, has been the basis of a lot of the basic science research in ALS over the last several decades, um, including all of most of the models uh, that we use. There are some newer models now. And over the years, uh, more and more discoveries uh, have been made of uh, other kind of uh, probably more rarer disease uh, genes that are, are difficult to find in any clinical population. Um, and then the biggie comes around here in about 2011, the C9ORP72 hexanucleotide repeat. And uh, the size of these, um, these uh, circles uh, are basically the relative um, uh, number of uh, patients or the percentage of the familial disease that's found with these kinds of mutations. And as I said, we continue uh, to have more mutations that are found both in families with ALS, but also now in sporadic ALS. We're finding mutations in sporadic ALS. And probably the genetic basis of ALS is probably much more interesting than just these genes and probably just the 10 to 12 percent of pa uh, patients where it runs in families. There are going to be complex gene abnormalities that are underlying the causes uh, and the driving of this disease. <clears throat> And um, again, all of these mutations combined still only explain about 10 to 12 percent of ALS. Um, I've uh, outlined these mutations. I'm going to specifically uh, pay attention to C9ORF72 um, because these are the ones that you see the overlap for the most part between ALS and frontal temporal dementia. And um, you can see here there are some uh, disease genes that will really just cause frontal temporal dementia. And these disease genes that just cause ALS, including SOD1, uh, the one that, that was uh, really the, the harbinger of, of um, genetically based ALS. But you can see these ones in the middle, excuse me, um, uh, ones in the middle um, can cause both ALS and FTD, including the most common one, which is C9ORF72. And this is what it looks like. Um, so we call this the G4C2 expansion mutation. Now, we all have um, these repeats in our genome and they're of different sequences. And in fact, there are repeat associated diseases, mostly in neurology, that we've known about for a long time, including things like Huntington's disease um, and um, fragile X in uh, uh, mental retardation. But in fact, this one, those are usually three nucleotides, trinucleotide repeat diseases. This is a hexanucleotide repeat. These are six, a G4C2. G, 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 C, C. And we all have a certain number of repeats, somewhere probably between 2 and 10 for most of us. Um, and as far as we know, we're not sure why we have them, but they're there. Um, but in patients with ALS and patients with FTD, they might have very large expansions, hundreds or thousands of these expansions. And it's absolutely um, fascinating um, the different ways that these expansions could potentially cause disease, and I'm going to go through that for you. And this is the way we, we identify it. Uh, great work done in 2011 by the groups um, of Rosa Rademakers and uh, Brian Trainer. Um, and you can see this is what a normal looks like, and there's nothing out here. But people with the repeat expansion have this um, on their um, ge uh, genetic um, uh, screening. We call this repeat prime PCR. <clears throat> 
Um, so we actually were interested in this and said, okay, well, what's the difference between patients who have C9 and non-C9? And we went back through all the DNA that we had um, from patients. Um, we ended up having, uh, with clinical uh, information, about almost 800 patients. We sent them, we, we separated out to patients with known family histories um, of ALS and people without family histories of ALS. And you can see that only about 4% of patients without family histories had this um, uh, expansion mutation. Um, where, in fact, um, patients with known family histories, almost 40% of them, uh, again, that sits with the, with the um, international literature. And we found some other mutations as well. And this is an interesting piece here. If we just looked at survival, these are the patients who have the expansion, and these are the patients who don't. And you can see the patients who have the expansion don't live as long. Um, it's a real uh, huge difference. Um, the other thing we found... Um, is that obviously um, they mostly look about the same. So if a patient comes into the clinic, um, if, especially if they're not demented, I can't tell whether they're, they have a genetic mutation. They look about the same, and that's, that's this stuff up here. But the difference really is um, the clinical FTD that you see in this group. And this is what it looks like pathologically. And this GGGGCC, um, in, in the repeat, um, there's an interesting biology here, um, which is um, a way to translate um, DNA into protein um, that is unusual. Typically, you have to have what's called a start codon to say, okay, in the gene, this is where we start and this is where we uh, make our protein from there. But in fact, you don't need this. Um, and in fact, in this, for, oops, excuse me, for some reason, um, uh, the machinery doesn't need that here, and so it can take the GGGGCC and make these things called dipeptides. And these are called dipeptide repeat proteins. And in fact, if you're reading this, and that's what DNA is, is read, um, um, you can read it and you can have two different amino acids, because an amino acid is made up by three of nucleotides, so that's glycine alanine. But if you shift it over one, you get glycine proline, and you shift it over another one, you get glycine arginine. So these are three dipeptide repeat proteins that can be made. And in fact, you can read it in the opposite direction as well. And there are two more dipeptide repeat proteins that can be made. And what's interesting about these things is they actually form inclusions as well in neurons, in the brain and in the spinal cord. And you can see here, um, this is um, the GA, the GP, GR, GA. And you can see them uh, in, this is actually in the hippocampus of the brain. But the other thing they can do um, is create these things called RNA foci. And so between DNA and protein is another uh, thing called RNA. DNA is made into RNA, RNA is made into protein. And these long strips of RNA can actually coagulate themselves and co form these things that are called RNA foci that you can see as these red dots here. And the question now, scientifically, that's being worked on very aggressively is, what do these things do? Do they kill neurons? Um, are they part of the disease? And if we get rid of them, can we treat the disease? <clears throat> um, so here are the, the major um, ideas of how this can work. Um, so in fact, uh, one possibility is that we don't make enough of the normal C9 or 72 protein. That's called a haploinsufficiency. And there's a little bit of data to support that. Uh, another possibility is that um, these RNA foci actually are, are sticky, and they, and they take other RNA, and so the cell can't work uh, properly. Um, and then possibly those proteins that are made, those dipeptide repeat proteins, um, are toxic to the cell, and they can kill the cell. And there's evidence for all three of these, in fact. But all of that evidence comes from um, either in vitro, in the laboratory, experiments, in dishes, or in, in animal models. It's not clear what happens in humans at this point. Um, another possibility, and this is, this is one that's real hot topic, is something called nucleocytoplasmic transport. Um, this is a whole biology I never knew existed until this came out. Um, and in fact, um, there are literally uh, hundreds of proteins that are important for moving things in and out of the nucleus of a cell. And it turns out that all of these mechanisms can get in the way of moving things in and out of the cell. And there's a lot of data coming out now suggesting that this nucleocytoplasmic transport may be disruptive enough to neurons that it actually kills them. I won't say much more about that at this point. So here's the excitement about this. There, um, we can measure these, well, not we, um, uh, the folks mostly at the Mayo Clinic, uh, Len Petroselli's group, um, 
has uh, really worked on how do you measure these things. Can you measure these by dipeptide repeat proteins? And one of the problems in ALS clinical trials over the last several decades is that we give drugs to people and we hope they get better or we hope they don't get worse. But we don't know whether the drug makes it where it wants to go. We don't know whether the drug actually hits the target that we think we're shooting at. We just give them drugs. And uh, you know, that sounds terrible, but that's because that's the best we can do at this point. But this is better. This is better. And it's better because now we can measure these proteins. And the target for these trials is to make these proteins go away with the idea that if we make these proteins go away, in fact, we may actually make the disease better. We don't know that that's true yet, but at least we'll get a sense, I believe, of whether we've actually hit the target that we're shooting at. And so here you can see that in patients without the C9, you can't measure these proteins. They're called poly-GPs. But in patients with C9, you can measure them in the spinal fluid here. Interestingly enough, even in patients who are asymptomatic but are carrying the disease gene, these are usually children of um, patients who um, have C9, ALS, or FTD, we can start to, to measure these GP proteins even in their spinal fluid. And we can go, or they can go a step further. Um, uh, you can see here that in the blood cells, these are called uh, peripheral uh, blood mononuclear cells. They can measure these things as well. And even uh, if you lyse those cells or put them in the media, you can measure these cells. So they're getting released from the cells as well. So that's pretty interesting. We can measure them. That's great. But in fact, if we use these things called antisense oligonucleotides, we can make them go away. Now, again, this is done in vitro in the laboratory. Um, but in fact, if you do it in an animal that's carrying this gene and gets the pathology of these dipeptide repeat proteins, you actually can, they're the dipeptide repeat proteins in an animal that's not treated. Here's an animal that's treated with this what's called an antisense oligonucleotide. You can see they go away. So there is the preclinical model that gives us the hope that maybe we can do this in people. And here's another piece of data um, that I was involved in. And so what you can see here is that these poly-GP proteins over time in patients who have multiple spinal fluid collections don't really change. And some people might say, well, that doesn't help us. But in fact, it helps us a lot. Why does it help us a lot? Because if it's stable and we're actually able to target those dipeptide repeat proteins, they'll go down. And that means we've hit our target. Because if they were all over the place, we wouldn't really know that. And so that's really, really important. That's really exciting. And in fact, um, this is the antisense oligonucleotide made by a company called Ionis and is going into trial soon by Biogen, hopefully by early spring uh, in patients with C9-related ALS. Very exciting uh, time for this. Do I have a few minutes? You have seven minutes. I have seven minutes. I can slow down. <laughs> okay, thank you. This is really exciting, isn't it? Um, a new drug for ALS. The first drug in greater than 20 years to show effectiveness in slowing the course of ALS. And this is from the Radicava website. Many of you have heard about this. The patients are very excited about this. It's a difficult drug. Why is it a difficult drug? It's extraordinarily expensive. Um, you have to give it intravenously, um, and you have to give it repeatedly. Um, and we've had a lot of trouble, at least at our center. I know this is happening, at least in the United States at other centers. Um, it's, it's hard to actually get infusion centers to give it um, because of multiple things. But we're willing to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week if we have a drug that actually makes a difference in this disease. I'd like to show you the data. Here's the data. This is the data published in Lancet in 2017. Um, what you can see here, um, this is the um, ALS FRSR, which many of you are familiar with. It is a subjective rating scale where we ask patients specific questions and we ask them about their function, including whether they need to use a banister going up and down the stairs, whether they can turn in bed, whether they're having too much saliva, things like that, all about function. Um, it's not a linear scale. Um, it, each one has a, a, a 1 to 4, basically, or 0 to 4. Um, the total is 48 if you're normal. Um, and so things can bounce around a little bit. Um, but it's been a validated scale. It's the one we use in most ALS clinical trials as an outcome measure. And what you can see here in patients on the drug, um, at the red, <laughs> 
versus patients in the placebo group, um, you can see that at 24 weeks, there's a difference, and that's a statistically significant difference in this ALS FRSR. Now, this is not just everybody with ALS. In fact, the company had already done a study in all comers with ALS and found it wasn't, didn't work. But they went back and said, is there a subpopulation where it does work? And this is a subpopulation. You have to have scores of at least two points on all 12 items of the LS FRSR. You have to have a forced vital capacity of 80% or more. You have to have definite or probable ALS according to something called the ALS Goyle criteria, which are research criteria for ALS. Um, and then you have to have a relatively early onset disease, disease duration of uh, two years or less. And you can also see they started out with 69 patients on the drug and 68 patients not on the drug. And this is the data. That's the data that led to approval. This was all done in Japan. And this is the data that was presented to the United States FDA. And this is the data um, that led to approval of this drug. Great. Um, so um, our experience has been that many of the insurance companies uh, that we deal with are asking for these data here. Um, even though it's been approved for everybody, the insurance companies make the decision. Uh, for a drug that costs more than $150,000 a year, um, it's the insurance companies that make the decision, and they're asking for this. And in fact, there are relatively few patients who actually meet these criteria um, in the real world in a, in a real clinic. And so in our clinic, which is a pretty large clinic, we have yet to be successful in getting a patient this drug. Not that we haven't tried. We have tried really, really hard. Okay, so that's okay. We'll get that worked out, um, we'll make it work, and let's see if it works. So here's the data that was published later. Because the real question was, that was only 24 weeks, it was only six months. So what the company did is they actually said, okay, after six months and we show that it works, now everybody's gonna get the drug. This is called the open label extension. And what you can see here, um, in the open label extension, uh, again, this is the placebo, then in Daravone versus endaravone and daravone. So the blue, they continue on the same course here, as you can see. And in fact, um, when the patients who were in the placebo group were given the endaravone, unfortunately, they didn't seem to change. They, didn't, they continued to, to get worse, um, which was unfortunate and, and a little bit surprising. And then if you look at the survival data that's been published now, what you can see here, again, um, if you look at the double-blind period, which is when there was a placebo group here, okay, there's your separation that, that was um, made approval there. But then when these patients who were on placebo were given a Daravone, this is what happened to them. Now, I don't know what that means. Um, in fact, um, they, these, are, these are not necessarily deaths. These are just bad outcomes, and they list a bunch of bad outcomes here. But it looks like when the patients who were on placebo were given the drug after six months, they actually seemed to get worse. I don't know, I, again, I don't know what it means. It's very disappointing. Um, and so it kind of colors this whole thing a little bit differently. Um, and this is, I just want to compare it to what we have on Riazol. Riazol's been around since about 1994, 1995. Um, and there have been many large clinical trials, and this is survival. This is survival, not ALS FRSR. And what you can see here in three placebo-controlled clinical trials, um, I'll just tell you that all of them worked. And if, if you combine all the clinical trials in terms of survival, um, this is the patients uh, on the drug, this is the patients not on the drug. Again, not a great drug, but every time it's tried, people survive longer. And this is a drug that you can take as a pill. And this I found on the internet, um, which was a little bit disturbing as well. And again, I'm just presenting data. I'm not making any judgments here. Um, this is from the FDA. Um, and this is public information. And this is, comes from the FDA meeting of approval. And it says here, the review team of the Office of Biostatistics is not enthusiastic with respect to approval. They note that there is only one support, uh, study supporting efficacy. Um, and the review furthermore highlights the limitations of this positive study. And so, um, I hope it works. Um, um, I'm always looking for a new drug um, for patients with ALS. That's what I spend my life doing. Um, but I'm not so sure about this one. Even though there's a lot of enthusiasm out there, uh, I'm just not so sure. So um, that's it. That's all I got to say. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>
It's a great presentation, thank you. Uh, uh, my, I did not um, really examine the, the, this drugs, uh, the detail of the clinical trial. Uh, I wonder whether you paid attention to the dropout in each group. I did. And do you know what is the dropout number? Yes, so um, at the end of the um, open label, there were only 37 patients left <laughs> in the um, placebo in the placebo and, and Darabone group, um, as opposed to 60 patients, I think, or 58 patients left in the, in the Endarabone and Darabone group. That data is here. And the survival data, did they include the dropout of the drug treat yes. group? Yes, yeah. here. Um, I spelled research wrong. Um, yes, you did. Sorry. I did it in a rush. Um, I can't go back. Okay, um, it's okay. Yeah, there were more dropouts in the placebo Adaravone group than there were in the Indaravone and Daravone group. Okay, in, in the survival in the survival data. That that all that stuff is published. Um, they have a series of papers published in the ALS journal um, several years ago. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm I'm sorry. Several months ago, not oh, several years ago. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anybody else? John. I just, yeah. I just want to underscore um, something that I may or may not have come out, but C9ORF72 is the most common uh, genetic abnormality in ALS, and it accounts for 4% at least of genetic, uh, of all ALS and 40% of, of hereditary, and it's also found quite frequently, relatively, in the sporadic population, some population 7%, some as low as 4%, which means if we solve if we have a tool like a biomarker, like the measurement of the dinucleotide peptides, um, we will solve maybe upwards of 10% of ALS in one fell swoop if antisense technology works. And so I think that's important. And who wouldn't, you know, how many of us would love to solve at least 10% of people living with ALS? So I just wanted to underscore the importance of this. Agreed. Um, very much so. And, and just to let everybody know, the idea of antisense technology for a treatment for a fatal neurodegenerative disease has already been proven. Um, so um, children um, with something called spinal muscular atrophy, which is another motor neuron disease, which is caused by, it's only caused by a, a specific gene mutation, has significant, I'm not going to say cured, but significantly been changed um, in terms of, of survival. These are kids who died by 18 months and are now riding bicycles. Um, at age four and five years old. So the technology works. The question is whether we can make it work in ALS. And also CRISPR technology has been applied to Hunter's disease. And so the genetic variants of ALS are going to probably be our first successes or some of our major successes right. in, in the future. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, there's a question over here. Um, my uh, query is, oh, um, obviously you focused on the a genetic component, um, whether there are any developments uh, on the um, environmental causes of ALS. I think um, one interesting thing is um, the viral link, viral, if, if there is a viral link. Viral? viral yeah. yeah. We, there are are you some, talking about the endogenous retroviral data? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have thoughts about that. Um, um, endogenous retrovirus is not a new topic for ALS. It's been around for a long time. A lot of people have looked for it. Um, there was an exciting publication uh, in 2015 or 2016 um, suggesting that patients uh, with ALS are more likely to have these endogenous retroviruses. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about that a little bit more. Um, I, if it's something, um, I don't think it's a big deal, um, but I, I think it deserves further study. Thank you. Should I stop? Yes, sir. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.